Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another Coach's Mailbag. I posted on the YouTube community tab and said you could ask any tennis questions that you want, but I encouraged questions about pro technique. And that is because I don't think there's anybody who writes better, who writes smarter about pro technique and how it affects tactics, psychology, and everything that affects professional tennis than my guest this week, Hugh Clark, on his phenomenal newsletter, Thread of Order. We start by talking about Stefanos Tsitsipas' one-handed backhand on the back of his Monte Carlo title. Is it technically flawed? Is it actually bad or not? Yes, inspired by Intuitive Tennis' last video that I did watch, and uh, it made me think a lot, so I wanted to follow up on that. Uh, we talk about Kaspar Ruud. Is the results in big finals technical or is it mental? We talk about Alcaraz versus Sinner as it pertains to peaking. We get into Yannick Sinner and his easy power. Focusing on strengths or fixing weaknesses? What's the balance between those two things? Why do Americans serve so big on average? What are the technical changes that Alcaraz has made to his serve? We talk about some of the more unorthodox ATP forehands like Hachanov and Tiafo and Musetti. Uh, we talk about how you could stop double faulting if that's an issue that you have on court. Uh, the importance of footwork. And finally, what Hugh and I would do if we were tasked with stepping into Novak Djokovic's coaching box. Always pains me to leave so many great comments on the cutting room floor that I know would have led to great discussions that we just didn't get to, but we go about an hour, and I think you're going to enjoy this conversation with Hugh Clark. We're joined for the first time by Hugh Clark, the excellent author of the Substack Thread of Order. We've been uh, consuming each other's work for a long time, one of my absolute favorite sources in all of tennis. Uh, so Hugh, thanks for coming on Monday Match. Well, actually, this is not Monday Match. Thanks for coming on The Mailbag. It's a pleasure to be here, and the feelings mutual, Gil. I love uh, when you drop the the post match analysis, and uh, it's always good to compare notes for me after after writing something as well. I think we do differ a little bit in kind of what where we like to gravitate to sometimes, and that's something that I I love about reading you, uh, because I think correct me if I'm wrong, your overall perspective is that analysis and discussion of pro technique is underserved or potentially under discussed when it comes to what's happening in these matches yeah i think um at the top of the game uh it plays a bit more of an outsized effect i think that doesn't get the attention it deserves or and, I, and i'm not saying it's the most important i just don't think it gets as much attention as it should when it's like hey there's a reason this player can't hit this shot or misses this shot under pressure. And so, yeah, fundamentals are, are key, but I, I like to just touch on that a little bit more for sure, the technical side. Yeah, and I think one of the major reasons, and this is a compliment to you, is that it's just hard to cover because it technique is a little bit more complex in, in some ways, I think, than understanding someone's physicality, or some of the more basic tactical patterns, uh, or, or even the the mental game, which can kind of be analyzed to an extent. That one's hard as well. I want to start not with the viewer question, but something that has definitely been on my mind in regards to what we're, we just started talking about, which is uh, Titi Pass and Monte Carlo and his backhand because I was looking at the analytics of my last Monday match analysis. I saw that 7% of people who went to the video were recommended by or from a video titled Tsitsipas does not have a bad backhand. It came from a channel that, that I really like for technical analysis. Um, and and I, I have a lot of respect for intuitive tennis. He argued Tsitsipas does not have a bad backhand. The reasons were, one, he's accomplished this and that and this and that. He's gotten to such a level that it's impossible to have a bad backhand. The second argument was, I studied his technique. The technique is good. 
and I'm trusting my eyes and I, I see the technique. It's good. Therefore, he does not have a bad back end. So I have thoughts. I want to talk about that. But first, I want to give you the floor. Yeah, so I actually got this comment after my, uh, in my sub stack, I got this comment as well. And my answer was, I don't think Titsipas has a technically flawed backhand either. I mean, I would prefer in the modern game players who have a straighter hitting arm earlier in the backswing, like a team or a Shapovalov. I think that helps with timing. But my main issue with Titsipas is because he doesn't have a reliable chip or a really go-to slice uh, when he's defending on that side, he tries to come over balls that a one-hander often doesn't have any business coming over. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking about on hard courts against big servers, especially because he waits in a forehand grip. He's having to change grip and then come over the return. And to me, that's just not a viable strategy at the very, very top. He's an amazing player, amazing athlete. He's a tall player. But, I mean, I think if you look at like a Dimitrov or a Dan Evans, these guys defend their backhands pretty well with just the, the slice a lot of the times. And, and for me, if Titsipas wanted to get better on faster services against bigger services, bigger service services, servers, it's not about improving his top spin backhand technique. I really think it's about getting his slice and his block a lot better. Right. And, and you know, I'm cycling the names through my head. Stan, team, um, you know, they, they do all develop an emergency. I'm, I don't have the time. So I slice. And I think it was a yeah. major thing for team on hard court. He started enabling himself to play further up in the court because he wasn't as susceptible to being rushed. It helped his entire game. It helped his ability to attack off of his forehand on hard court, but it started with Nicholas Masu coming in and making him really comfortable hitting the slice. Didn't have to use it that much on clay, but once the ball started coming quicker and he started playing further up in the court, it, it was necessary for him uh, to use it. Even Shapovalov, it's the first thing. Mikhail Yuzny, fellow one-handed backhand, came in and was like, yo, we got to start blocking returns. And that was the first order of business. So I think that's such a good way to look at the Tsitsipas backhand is to be like, you need that option. You don't have that option. It makes the drive look worse because you don't have that option. Going back to... The, the overall logic of, of the idea that Tsitsipas does not have a bad backhand. Um, first of all, I do think top five players can have weaknesses relative to their peers and do have weaknesses relative to their peers. So first you need to dissect the word bad. And if, mm. if you mean bad as in not at a high-end professional level, it's not bad. Zverev's forehand is not bad. None of this stuff is bad if you want to compare it to a certain, you know, if you want to look at kind of a, a larger picture. But, uh, but we're, we're always comparing these things to the peers, right? So Tsitsipas' backhand compared to his peers, I believe, is something that gets exposed. And if you look at the technique and it's perfect, that's great. But then it's like, what's happening in the matches? And if you study enough of what is happening in the matches, and it goes back to the Brad Gilbert question, who is doing what to who? Which is probably, mm -hmm. if I were to ex describe the, the basis of, the, of, of what I look for when I'm watching a tennis match and really dumb it down, that would be it. Who's doing what to who? And if you look at that over the years with Tsitsipas, it is very clear that the backhand is the part of his game where players find an advantage in one way or another. Yeah. And I mean, like his forehand is amazing at uh, when he's both running to it and when he wants to take it early. And so I think, you know, he wants to take on a pretty aggressive core position, but players who can rush him, who can like Alcaraz, he can go harder to his forehand and take it early and rush him into the backhand. And I mean, last year at Barcelona, you see him just completely bailing out of a, top spin pass because he doesn't have that Dan Evans slice that could, or that even that Alcaraz slice, you know, as a two hander that can play the ball late, you know, play the ball slow. So you buy yourself time. And, and it's such a crucial shot for a one hander. It, it's kind of amazing to me actually that he's gotten to where he's got without it. It actually is testament to his serve, his forehand and, and his top spin backhand, you know? Yeah. And that's the other part. That is the explanation for why TT pass has been able to make 
Ro- uh, Roland Garros final and win Monte Carlo three times and he, and win a year end championship in 2018 and break into the top five. It's the forehands elite. The movement is elite. The serve is, if you want to take the top 100, it's probably top 20. Uh, his transition game is probably the best in the world. So he's got all of these things. He does amazingly well. You don't need to be awesome at everything. Weaknesses can exist and you can have a great, uh, great successes in your career. Although uh, if you want to look at the next level, which what we started talking about and we get to the Alcaraz and Sinner and Djokovic and Medvedev tier, it starts to become a lot harder to kind of pick those holes. Let's get to the first comment. Uh, it's a long one. It has to do with the other Monte Carlo finalist. It comes from Mr. Potato. Yes, there are a lot of interesting usernames on the mailbag. Hi, Gil. I think everyone's being wrong on Rude. I think he is amazing mentally, and his losses in finals are purely due to technique. He is one of the most consistent players on tour, and that's because of the way he plays and the way he structured his technique along the years. Logical game plans, lots of margin on both wings, much rarer on the backhand side. Plays to big targets, exceptional mover with great stamina, but no hot shot defense. Everything he does is calculated to win, to be good most of the time. He's an A- minus player almost every time he takes the court. The opposite of that type of player would be Felix or Dennis, who are able to be A-plus players, but also a C player. We've, all, we've seen them beating Nadal, Djokovic, Carlos, etc. But have we seen Casper playing an A-plus? I don't think so. I don't think it's because of the way he is constructed as a player. That's why I think he loses every big final he plays. His A minus leads him to finals, but is never enough for him to beat a big player in form. He's never done that. He has beaten Novak, but he was out of form. He has a win over Hachanov, who was in form in the semifinal of a Grand Slam, but that's not a big player. He has beaten Runa and Zverev in the French out of form. Okay, um, and now he gets the comment continues. Uh, he has... He has too many liabilities, backhand defense, forehand penetration, average serve, average return, slow backhand, to be able to beat these guys. I really don't think it's a mental thing. I'm going to skip to the end now. Rude has to try to develop new skills like Sinner did to become a player who can win everything. And I don't know if he has it in him because the ways he is built may be limited. Maybe on clay with a more aggressive forehand and some physical domination. Long comment. Long comment. Um, I actually somewhat agree. I actually think rude ceiling relative to these guys he's losing to is clearly lower. Uh, and also in terms of his athleticism, I don't think he's a tier one athlete like a Novak or even a Sinner now. Um, his backhand is clearly heavy and, and consistent, but he can't take it line like the guys he's losing to, like Alcaraz and, and Djokovic and Sinner, he can't take it line as well. And I think if he could do that, if he could add that element to his backhand side, he would become much more of a threat. I also don't think he defends his forehand as well as those guys. He, his forehand is really good when he's got time, obviously. And so players who can take their backhand line into Casper's running forehand, I think he's not like Djokovic, who is pretty dangerous if you give him a running forehand, you know? So yeah, he, he does a lot of things very well. You know, he serves for his height pretty well. He hits his forehand very well. He's consistent with his backhand. I think he plays a pretty smart game when he transitions to hard court. I think he chips and returns and then drops back on second like Barinka. So I think he's a guy who's actually done pretty well to, to uh, I don't want to say he's maximized his game, but I think he's, he's done really well yeah i know you were critical of him in, in your uh, match analysis the other day and i agree like his forehand definitely was not there but uh, i felt he felt he had to really have that shot humming against titsy pass because titsy pass if he takes control of the point rude is just not an elite defender yeah well uh, i also mostly agree with this commenter that it's not as if this this guy has you know, just always folds mentally, and that fully explains the 0 and 7 in finals above the 250 level. He there is a skill gap, an ability gap in in these finals. Now, my my common thread criticism, which I've basically always had, 
after these finals, other than the Roland Garros final he played against Djokovic last year, where I, I really thought he backed himself when it comes to his best shot, is it's just sometimes I feel like he's not unleashing on the forehand. And it's a it's some it's kind of a fear thing to me. It's a nerves thing to me. And I just want him to trust that shot. Win with it, lose with it, but freaking hit it. Uh that that's kind of been my my main criticism. But it's interesting what 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 you say about the forehand defense. I totally agree. I would also talk about the backhand defense in the same vein. He doesn't have the open yeah. stance, hard backhand defense where, first of all, you can approach it. Uh, but also, I find he chips it all the time, right? Like Alcaraz, when when he plays rude, something he loves is to hit the ball. Maybe he doesn't know immediately that it's an approach shot, but he'll look at the left hand, and as soon as it slides up the racket for the slice, he darts in and mm -hmm. knocks off a floater uh, because Rude is chipping the ball. He doesn't have that open stance. So when you combine a tendency to get passive in when, when there's nerves, um, which I think Rude has, drop he, his court position drops back, he won't go as big, with uh, defensive abilities that I think sometimes just based on the fact that he has so much success on clay and that he's kind of a baseliner, defensive abilities that in some ways might be a little overrated by some, mm -hmm. that's a bad combination. So I think when he's at his best, when his forehand is the biggest problem on the tennis court. Yeah, and I agree. Like that French Open final, that first set or so against uh, Djokovic, he really did get the ball high and heavy and really take it with his forehand. Um, but, you know, great players will figure out how, how to weather those, those moments. And then, you know, Djokovic played an unbelievable tiebreaker and then, with a lead, it's just much easier. But uh, I don't know in terms of what he could do from here to improve. I liked his backhand change he made at the end of 2022, where he actually got his his racket hit more inside, more like an Albandian type to type take back. And I thought he was hitting it pretty well then. I think I tweeted to Jeff Sackman if he was going cross court more now than than maybe prior prior um times. But I, I'm not sure that was the case. But yeah, his ability to hit his backhand line, I think, would would make him a completely greater threat uh, than what he's currently doing on that side. Cause he's a little predictable on that wing and, and it worked against, again, most of the field, but it, if you want to beat the Djokovic's and the Alcaraz and the Sinners, you, you got to hit all four shots cross line, both sides. I agree with that. And because of the slower speeds on that backhand, it gives a Tsitsipas or a Djokovic even more time to run around and find their forehand off of Rude's cross court backhand. I think that's been a big problem. I think the two the two main things that a Novak has has looked to do against Casper is one serve and volley against the deep return position, especially in big spots. And Cici it arguably completely bailed him out in the second set that he was able to do that. And then two find that backhand, look for the run around, crush mm -hmm. it inside in. Yeah. So. Those have been the two patterns. Let's go to the next one. This was the top liked comment uh, from Hardy Har. It's a Sinner Alcaraz question. Hi, Gil. My question comes in two parts. First, I've seen a general sentiment this season regarding the Alcaraz Sinner rivalry that goes something like this Alcaraz is better than peak Sinner, but average Sinner is better than average Alcaraz. Do you agree with this assessment? Let's uh let, let's stop there and just answer that part. Uh, I think that's a an interesting interesting question right there. Is peak Alcaraz better than peak Sinner? I think uh I think I'd have to say this is kind of for me uh condition specific. I mm. think uh you know peak, players play at their peak when also the conditions suit them, you know. So I think when the ball sits up a little more like we see at Indian Wells and you get a little more bounce and purchase that suits Alcaraz's kick serve. It suits his forehand. The ball stays up high on his backhand. I think we've seen Sinner be able to really rush Alcaraz at Wimbledon and, and um, last year at Beijing and a few of these other hard fought faster services. So I'd say peak for peak, uh, 
Yeah, it's tough. I, I think it's condition specific for me. I don't know if that is a good answer for that person, but uh, that's what I have to say. No, and and I I'm kind of with you because I think if the conditions are quick, the the serve return, like Sinner serving at his best, returning at his best, that's that's difficult. It's court. difficult for right. Like what can Alcaraz do when that's happening? Because he he can't really match Sinner serve for serve, return for return. I don't think. Uh, now, if they get into more rallies, that's where. That's where I, I agree that Alcaraz's athleticism and his shot making uh, is is a notch above, especially when that forehand is firing. Um, and I, I would also kind of attack this question in a way that doesn't fully embrace it because I'm not sure it matters. And I, I get this a lot. The question about peaking and whose peak is better and what's the best peak. And it takes it takes everything in me to not just be like, what does it matter? Like tennis is not really <laughs> about peaking. It's the opposite, yeah. Can you win playing bad a lot of the times? You know, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a fun pub question. You know? It is. And I used to have it all the time, but uh, yeah, is it peaking for a set? Is it peaking for a season? Is it you know like? Uh, sure. Yeah, it's a it's it's a fun one. And I suppose it normally is a question that simply like it just blindly favors the more offensive player usually. Right, because yeah. like great offense beats great defense. Uh, yes, I mean, and it's the same thing in, in basketball, right? Hand in the face, forty foot three pointer. If it goes in, it goes in. And I think it's the same yeah. thing in tennis. It's like I can I can hit a return deep middle perfect, and Alcaraz might hit a winner. And it's like okay, well, I I, I hit a good return, but it didn't matter. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's always like peak soddling at Roland Garros, just teeing off like. Uh... Yeah, I mean, if someone that size is going to tee off and make it, uh, good for them. But it's just hard to do. So, next one is from Tiger. I'm not going to read the whole username. Uh, any thoughts on why Sinner is capable of hitting so big with so little effort? Sinner, yeah. I mean, one, uh, he has pretty. His backhand is a pretty long stroke, and the way he uh, takes it back. He sort of has like a, a dynamic flip, you know, like he sets it outside and he, he throws it all the way back. And it's quite a long swing from once it's uh, all the way back there, which I've sort of touched on in some of my pieces. But, um, you know, he's a tall guy too. And, and even though he's lean, he's quite thin, you know, he has long levers, you know. So the way he's able to coil on his forehand and, and uncoil, obviously these guys have amazing timing, but it's really a kinetic chain question, you know, like he's coiling quite a, he's, he's coiling a really long chain, you know, he's a tall guy and he's got long swings and he, he's uncoiling well and, and he gets on the front foot a lot, even on his forehand. He's a player who's really good at getting his left foot down the court on his forehand more than most. I think Warinka had that trade a little bit as well, but um, yeah, I mean, he, he, he's using his kinetic chain just a bit better than other guys. I really love that point about the left foot. Uh, he he loves that three quarter stance forehand. It's not fully yeah. open. It's not fully closed. Nadal loves it too. He gets to that spot all the time. I think that's man. It's it's something that I, is maybe a common thread in a lot of the best forehands is is they do a really good job of getting into that footwork. Uh, and and also I think yeah, big kinetic chain, elasticity, looseness right? It's like the, the shoulder looks loose. The, the wrist looks very, very loose. Would you, how, how yeah. important do you think it is that in order to create power, there is a, a certain relaxation within your explosivity? hundred percent. These guys are all, you know, very loose on their strokes. And, you know, Sina has that big flip from the outside, which, you know, really creates a stretch in his wrist and arm to let it slingshot out. So all these guys are very loose in the in the arm. It really comes from the legs and the core. And then, you know, the, the, the rest of the stroke takes care of itself. But yeah, Sina, amazing coil and long levers and an amazing timer of the ball and, and gets gets his weight through the shot a lot of the times. And, and that's why he crushes it. There you have it. All right. Uh, next one's from Anonymous Tennis Follower. Hi, Gil. I've heard some pro coaches say that it's better to focus on the strengths of a player instead of their weaknesses, even if the weakness is very glaring. 
For example, I remember hearing Brad Gilbert, Coco Golf's coach, saying something along the lines of using Golf's elite movement, serve, and backhand win points instead of hyper fixating on her forehand. How much do you agree with this? And if you agree, does it completely excuse players from fixing that one glaring weakness that they may have in their game as long as their strengths make up for it? What are your thoughts on the Brad Gilbert method, which I, I think a lot can be learned from, where instead of focusing on the weakness, he took all the attention possible away from that weakness. It was a mass attention shift. We're going to talk about anything but the forehand. Yeah, I. this is interesting because in my thesis, which I'm doing for sports psychology, I've interviewed some top coaches and this was a common thread that came out, which is focus on the strengths. And part of this was the fact that you know, as a player, if you try and do everything really well, you're probably not going to do anything really, really well. You know, John Isner was top 20 because of his serve, not because of his anything else, really. And so I agree with this sentiment in terms of really making sure a player gets clear on what their strengths are. You know, Berrettini is going to win matches with his serve and forehand. And uh, Kyrgios, you know, is going to win with his serve and his ability to you know, create a bit of chaos. So I would say though, that if you want to become a top four or five player now, it seems to me that if you have a weakness, like a, we'll call a rude backhand or a titsy pass backhand or a weakness, when we're talking about being top four or five, that I think is where there's a bit more of an edge if you can improve it. And, and if I look at the top guys, like I would say Demon is playing great tennis this year. His serves improved. I would say Sinner the biggest improvement for me has been his serve and his movement or his fitness, which were probably his weaknesses 12 months ago. So these guys who go from, you know, 10, 15 to two, three, four, I think, you know, the edge or, or the biggest bang for your buck is if you can improve a weakness, the difficulty is these guys all know their weaknesses. They know, you know, Oh, my backhand, I'm doing this. It's just really hard to change that. You know, these guys don't have a six-month off-season and, you know, you got to show up week to week and be ready to try and win the match and you're going to win the match with your strengths. So, yeah, I completely understand that, that sentiment. It is tough, right? We love to see adjustments. We love to see, oh, you changed that. That got better. Awesome. And uh, we've seen it with the big three a lot. Uh, we saw it. We've, we've seen it with, with Sinner quite a bit. Uh, but I, I think the the only thing I want to add to what you said there is Goff's forehand did get better, so the weakness did get better without a technical change because mm -hmm. it got stronger mentally. I'm reading Inner Game of Tennis right now, and a lot of what Timothy Galloway talks about in that book makes perfect sense when it comes to the Brad Gilbert approach because the the idea of overthinking not trusting your body to do the right thing, uh, tightening up your body because you have a certain uncertainty or a doubt about, again, your body doing the right thing when you hit a shot. All of that is symptomatic of being judgmental about one of your, uh, one of your strokes. So if you're very judgmental in your head about your forehand, and if you've read inner game of tennis, you know, it's self one judges self two, I believe. Um, you're actually going to hit your forehand worse, where if you just remove that and you're not thinking like, oh, my forehand sucks, my forehand sucks, uh, you're going to start hitting it better. So in that sense, uh, I do think that there is a limit to how, mu how much an, of an improvement um, you can make if you do have technical deficiencies, but certainly you can make a percentage of improvement just with your mind, which Coco did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if if you can also clarify your identity as a player, like if you're trying to sure. work on a weakness and turn it into a strength, you lose sort of that clarity of how you win your points, you know, and then instead of running around a forehand, you're now trying to hit your backhand down the line. It's like, no, Titipas should run around his backhand and, and find that forehand, you know. So there's that. Yeah. I, I guess the Coco, the Coco example of that would be Brad told her to move back on on return it's like you're super fast you need time on your forehand move back 
It's like, what are we standing and on the I think baseline he was for? saying, give it some more air. You know, she's got that, that western too. grip. It's good for producing that high spinny shot, which is less common in the, in the women's game. But, you know, she's, like you said, she's fast. She's got a great surge. She's got a great backhand. Protect that side and, and maybe even throw in that high spinny ball that gives the other players a different look. So, totally. Yeah. I will say, though, I still think she's at the mercy of a really good playing Sabalenka or, or uh, Rabikina maybe because those those girls, they do have stronger uh, forehands uh, and a pretty good backhand. So you still are at the mercy of an opponent playing better if they have better technique than you. I right, think. right. Next one from uh, Toodles Gaming. Why do Americans have such big serves? Other European players don't seem to have as much of a powerful serve as the Americans do. Can you explain why this is true? I have a theory. Do you? Yeah, I got a couple. Um, my first one is a Charlie Munger quote. Show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. If you're a South American or a European, and especially if you've grown up on clay, as a junior, you're not going to get much bang for your buck trying to crack a first serve compared to someone growing up in Australia or the US or even indoor courts here in Canada where your first serve is going to shoot through, you're going to, you're going to attract more errors. Uh, and so naturally I think you'll see Europeans develop more of a kick serve because they're going to just get more purchase with a kick serve on clay. My other one is there's a big throwing culture in America and Australia with cricket and baseball and NFL quarterbacks. And so they practice a lot of the similar movements you'll get, and I know Europe has, I guess, European handball, but South America in particular, I don't think there's that much of a baseball culture there, but they don't tend to have much of a throwing culture. And I've spoken to a, a South American coach about, about this, and he thinks it's a reason that uh, they don't develop quite the, the strength of serve that Canadians or U.S. players do. What's your theory? Yeah, throwing. I, I think we, we grow up throwing and – it, it helps helps on the serve and it was it's, it was just a, a really funny thing that happened this year was i'm watching arthur Cazo at the australian open and he's not very tall he's like six feet his motion is not all that fluid like there's a huge pause in the trophy position which let's talk about on the next comment but i i don't i didn't look at his technique and it didn't look like curios where it's like oh yeah that that technique is going to produce maximum power but Kazo was serving bombs. It's like 130, 135. I'm like, whoa, what is happening here? So I dig in and I do more research. It turns out Kazo had a decision to make when he was 13 years old, tennis or handball, tennis or handball. Yeah. So he was just throwing balls. And that's why I think it just developed that lively arm. Yeah, I think it's a, a factor for sure. You know, um, yeah, it, it's it's very similar to the the throwing motion where you get that stretch shortening cycle on the way back, and and the faster you can move the racket, the more power you'll produce. Uh, totally simple as that. Yeah. All right. So on that note, uh, there were a couple. There were two comments on this. I just took one of them. It's from Jason. Hey, go regarding the Alcaraz serve in the March second edition of the Draw. There is a link to an article about the mechanical changes to Alcaraz's serve from his coach. Uh, it was supposed to be translated from Spanish to English, but the link only showed the original Spanish version. Not sure if anyone else had the same issue, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you and Hugh could talk about some of those changes and if they've translated into improvements in consistency, speed placement, and points slash games held. Uh, thanks and appreciate the additional content provided in those newsletters. Yes. Thank you for uh, subscribing to The Draw. It is... Uh, the draw dot tennis to subscribe link is in the description. Also subscribe to Hughes newsletter, of course, thread of order. Uh, did you see this? I didn't see this. I mean, I've seen a slight change with his racket position, but I haven't seen this. So you'll have to tell me if this was more than that. Okay. So it was uh, Alcaraz's secondary coach, Antonio Martinez said a couple things. They are looking for Alcaraz to throw a higher toss for a longer pause in the trophy position, which they believe improves the rhythm and their model. One serve that they've looked at is Felix Oje Aliasim serve as somebody who has a similar technique, a big first serve where, where they like the rhythm of that. Now, 
when I read that, I was a little bit surprised because I feel like 90% of the time coaches are saying, let's bring the toss down and let's try to, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with the pause in the trophy position, but a lot of the best serves actually don't have it. Yeah. I mean, uh, Alcaraz does have that pause, which he has brought more onto his hitting side. He's lowered it a bit like an Andy Roddick, not as much, obviously, but I wonder if because he's now lengthening his serve, because it, he used to have that real clay quarter, abbreviated, place the racket back early. Yeah, and I think, you know, the coach said rhythm. I think that's most important, obviously, when you have having a service, you want to have rhythm. And maybe because he's now trying to, you know, get more internal rotation of the shoulder and, and get more of that rhotic position, maybe he needs the extra time with the high ball toss. But I'm always in favor of lowering the ball toss uh, because it speeds up the, the, the swing to the ball. But he has a pause, so... You know, maybe that's why I can only speculate. But um, yeah, I'm always in favor of players like Rude, like Curios, having that low, quick action. It's good for the wind. Um, Felix, I love, I love Felix's serve, but Felix doesn't pause either. So yeah, that's an interesting one to me. Yeah, I, I thought it was as well. Also, just ball toss consistency, which is uh, that's why my serve is crap because my toss is all over the place. <laughs> Everything else is pretty good, but I have a higher toss. And uh, yeah, that's <laughs> – so uh, we'll, we'll track it. I, let's see what happens. I mean, but it's it's not what I expected to hear from from the, the coaching team when it came to making gains on the serve. I, I, I do think he's so strong and so explosive and there's so much fast twitch that the pace comes very, very easily to him. So if, mm. if he can, you know, drive up that precision – and and hit his spots, he's going to kind of get what he's looking for out of the serve. You agree? Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, there's no question he he can absolutely bring the heat, but his his consistency and his yeah his accuracy is I think where he's going to get bang for his buck long term uh, with his game. Uh, this one is from Bruno Alves. How can players with large slash weird forehand take backs like Hachanov, Musetti, and Tiafo work on their technique to let's say be less rushed in faster conditions? Uh, so I don't know if they can make a huge technical change at this point. I don't know. I wouldn't say players like Kachanov and, and Tiafo are that rushed per se. I I'm not a fan of the lowered take back they have because especially on the run once you don't have your leg set you've lost leverage leverage being the racket tip higher than uh, your hand and most of the best running forehand have this leverage where when they don't have their legs or the momentum they can use gravity to get the racket speed going so uh someone like Musetti I think gets rushed purely because he's used to growing he's grown up on clay he has a big grip change from his backhand to his forehand uh, but that's not the case for Kashinov, who flips the racket. Um, yeah, I don't want to say they're rushed. I just think their forehand with their grips and their swings are just a little more, uh, what I say, noisy. There's a little bit more going on just around that, that moment before contact and when they're having to, to move to that, to that side. Yeah, I think Francis has shortened it. If you go back six, seven years, it's it looks – crazier i can't get into detail because i haven't put it side by side but the forehand i believe is shorter i think is less noisy than it used to be there's it, it still has that unconventional uh look to the take back in the case of hachinov uh i i think the improvement that he's made is what we what we were talking about earlier ask less of it so mm -hmm. he used to be a player who i i think felt like I'm 6'6", six, six, I'm big, I'm strong, I need to crush everything. Where in reality, the strength of his game was physical endurance and consistency. But he couldn't unlock that consistency until he he stopped trying to be such a, a first strike kind of offensive-minded player on the forehand side. And when he just started playing really high percentage, consistent tennis, used his mental toughness, his physical toughness, he got so much better. 
yeah, he's a guy who does a like a bit like Rude does a lot of things well, like serves well, back ends really good on the low faster services. He can redirect it well. And the running forehand for me is the biggest weakness for him. But when he's set, he can obviously unload on it. But yeah, I think he's a guy who has had an amazing career, made, made a lot of deep slams now on the back of being a very disciplined, very tough player who just does a lot of things well, you know? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's, let's help someone out here with the next one. It's from member Ryan J. Hi, Gil and Clark. Any tips on stopping double faulting? I practice my serve a lot, but whether I slice the second serve or just tap it over, I still miss it a lot. During a match, I feel like it's mostly nerves. What can I do technically and mentally to get over the yips? I hate giving out generic coaching really? advice without yeah. seeing someone serve, obviously. But I, think uh, he, I, I do think he gives us a clue. Sorry. Do you want, do you want me to go first? Clue. I, I, you go for it, yeah. I'll, I'll go first because w when you say sometimes I tap it in and sometimes I slice it in, uh, I, I do think you're kind of, without us even seeing it, you're kind of almost telling us what's happening. I always I always think the the benchmark that players should be trying to reach, and this isn't easy, but you should be getting to a point where you're swinging just as fast, if not faster, on your second serve as you are on your first serve where 95% of players, if not more, when they first start, they're going to swing fast on their first serve. They're going to slow it down for their second. And if you watch pros or high-level players, that is not what they do because they understand how to translate that racket speed into spin, usually top spin, but it's okay if, if you have some slice on it. Um, and I, I think the way to get over those mental yips is, is first – training and, and getting yourself into a spot where technically you're able to feel confident swinging fast on your second serve and still getting it in. Yeah. And uh, that's one thing uh, I am a big proponent of trying to get the continental group learn as soon as possible, because if you learn with more of that uh, Eastern forehand serve group, which is kind of the intuitive way beginners play, you can't swing fast at a second serve. And so uh, I'm a big fan of no matter the age or, or what level you're starting with, learning the continental and, and there are drills, uh, it's hard to show on camera, but there are drills to get that in, intuitively understand what your hand needs to do to start using the continental grip to hit a flat serve because most people when they go continental, they can only slice it. But once you start to learn how to hit the flat serve, I think it's the it's a painful path, but it's the the best part, if you want to have a consistent second serve with spin, like Gil was saying, you need to have something closer to that continental grip. Yeah. I totally agree. First coach I ever had, he was obsessed with grips. Grips, 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 grips. <laughs> and that was kind of his thing. And you know, eventually I outgrew that coach, but I, I think it was a great start. I really do. You know, where yeah. he, he, had, he had me not only hitting with the right grip on serve, but also you need to learn how to slice your backhand with this grip, hit over your backhand with the other grip, slice your forehand with this grip, hit over volley with that grip. So everything was a lot of training in continental grip for me starting off. I do think it, it actually developed a pretty nice base. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's one that if you play a, a lot without learning to hit with it, it just makes it harder down the road to volley, to, to hit the serve, to hit the smash, to hit the slice. So yeah play around with that continental grip and, and get a feel for it for sure. Yeah. Uh, next one is from Toodles Gaming. Again, I, I try not to pick the same person commenting twice, but it looks like I've done that here. I, I have heard a lot of top coaches say that the main way to truly improve your tennis is by doing physically exhausting footwork drills. They say that footwork and positioning are the most important thing you must have as a tennis player. They say this is what separates an expert player from an amateur. Do you agree with this? If yes, why is this the case? Physically exhausting footwork drills. What do you think? Uh, again, I'll say it depends. I have to see everyone's strokes. But I will say that a lot of club players do think it's technique when they're not in position. You know, it doesn't matter what your technique is. You have to be in position. And, the, and what the pros are really good at is moving in a position where they can make contact with the ball at a comfortable height. So... That might mean moving back 
so you don't have to hit uh, someone's high looping ball above your shoulder. Move back and let it drop around waist high. That might mean you move up to a short ball so you don't hit it below the net around your toes. A huge number of players are okay moving laterally, but they don't move up and down the court so they can hit their shot at a comfortable height. You know, the, the pros can hit shoulder height and above pretty comfortably because they've done that all their lives. But most players tend to have a comfortable height around, around waist high. And so if you can always move and find that waist high ball, I agree that's probably like a huge part of, of playing well as a club player. Yeah. Yeah, there are no accidental drop shots in the pro game, huh? <laughs> it's 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 always yeah. amazing. It's always amazing because it you know it it happens so much when you watch uh, civilians play the sport. Is like, oh, I hit it so short by accident. Uh, it bounced twice. It worked. Uh, the pros are so quick moving forward that you'll never ever see that. Uh, I I love that related answer. Related to that, I love that answer. Related by to you. that, uh, I would say. A huge thing that club players don't do is they don't split step. I coach a lot of people who don't split step. And if yeah. you don't split step, you could be Usain Bolt. You'll be a slow tennis player. Totally. And so get used to split stepping and really focusing on finding that contact point and you'll, you'll make your swings work a lot better. Yeah. If I go out and watch random players play, there's nothing that will hold back players more, in my opinion, than they're not split stepping. And same with kids yeah. who are just starting out. Uh, so I preaching to the choir there. I totally agree with that. Um, and being in shape helps. I'll just one more thing to tack on to this comment. It's like, if you can do it for three balls and then you get tired, obviously that limits you as well. So like fitness matters and definitely uh, those tough drills that aren't fun where you're exhausted in the end uh, can, can be beneficial, especially if you're doing it consistently, if you're doing it every day or, yeah. or three days a week, it's going to be a big help. Let's get Novak in. We haven't gotten Novak in. This one is from MA a question for both you and Mr. Clark. This will be, by the way, we're ending on the hardest question. What would be your approach to coaching Novak? If you were named his coach, what aspects of his game would you work on and how would you conduct yourself in the stands while he is playing a match? All right, here we go. Toughest job of our lives. Jeez. We are highly unqualified, uh, but let's let's give yeah. it our best. I mean, he does everything so well now. It's uh, what would I get him doing more? I mean, his goal seems to be the Olympics. You know, like the the clay, the Paris Olympics. Um, and he doesn't look. You know, this is not technical or anything, but he doesn't look fit enough, I think, to... And he's done this early in play season before where he doesn't look like he's going to be fit enough to win Roland Garros, but then does it. So there's nothing I would change in that guy's game technically, tactically. He knows his game better than anyone. But I think you've spoken about this. Now a huge part for him is his motivation and why is he playing and does he have a point to prove? And if I was a coach, I'd be really trying to tap into that and and find a narrative he can rally around and, and motivate him. And I do think he's at his best when it's sort of him versus the world and has that back against the wall mentality a bit. Um, so I would try and create that a bit. And, and, you know, how would I act in the stands? I mean, look, he's going to yell at me. That's fine. He, he, that's how he is for his his play style you know but um yeah i wouldn't change anything in his game is my is my short answer i would try and really tap into understanding why he's wanting to play and 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 get that as strong and as clear as possible i think that's a really good answer in team sports we talk about that all the time like oh this coach is a good motivator they know how to get in front of the mm -hmm. locker room and motivate the team and in tennis we throw that out. I've never heard that in tennis coverage of like that coach is a great motivator. Uh, but it's totally still a thing. It's still, it's still a part of coaching. And, uh, yeah, I, I think, I think that is a, bit, a big part of being in Novak's team right now is to get him fired up, you know, maybe just show him, uh, show him the press clippings from after his loss against Nardi, everybody's saying he's done. <laughs> Look at this, man. No, nobody thinks you could win another tennis match. Uh, I, I agree with you about the fitness. Again, I think it's goes goes back to his normal pattern. I, I think there was a point in time where he decided, 
I do not have the ability to be in great shape for 10 months out of the year anymore. Like I can't do it. So we stopped doing it. So uh, he he's hasn't been in shape in March and April uh, for in recent years. And then he'll just build up, he'll build up, build up, build up. Roland Garris, he'll be in shape. Um, I agree with that. Yeah. Now, as far as the thing in the stands, it did strike me when Goran was talking about the dynamics between him and, and Novak on court, it struck me as a situation where it was actually very hard to deliver Novak coaching because mm -hmm. he did not like to take time out of his routine to go up to the box to get his towel and to have that actual like close distance dialogue where everybody could hear each other and there were no dramatic hand motions and, and all the, all the things that come with it. So I, I think the next person might want to come in and talk about an approach in match to here's the information I can deliver you during the match uh, to, to kind of arm you with the best to take advantage and leverage the on court coaching better than him and Goran were able to do. Mm. Yeah, I mean, especially in those that you spoke about, it being in those stadiums, you can't give coaching verbally when they're all the way on their chair. It's just too loud. So, yeah, finding finding ways to come up with a few quick words that might mean something to them so they can make these exchanges quick and clear. Uh, yeah, that would be helpful. Make the most of it. On-court coaching is such a new science. I think 10 years from now, the coaches are going to sound different. The approaches are going to be completely different. It's unreasonable to expect that in year two of this, are we in year three? I, I, two or three? I think we're in year two. Two, two in like a couple months because I think it okay. started after the U.S. Open. Next-gen finals, right? Uh, right. But, but I think even after the U.S. Open, they said, we're going to do a trial. Okay. Are we still on the trial? Uh, I guess. I don't know. I, I think we're not, not putting that back in the bottle. No, we're not. I just think it's bizarre how they went about it. They announced a trial and they they never said anything about it and they just left it. But okay, uh, it's unreasonable to expect that everyone is going to have it figured out this quickly. And even with the analytic, the the new resources with the analytics and everything that's being put in, I just like to say, I think. I think everyone is going to get way smarter about it 10 years from now. And there's going to be more analytics being communicated that actually result in an action. So maybe the analytics are not what's communicated, but it's, it's look, uh, his, I don't know, just an example. Like you can look at average net clearance on the backhand return is, is eight feet. Like let's mix in the serve and volley here because he is floating these returns like just yeah. getting into that, into those relationships and just being like serve and volley is open, lots of net clearance on the back end return, something like that. I think there's going to be way more uh, of those detailed kind of instructions based on the data coming down the pipeline. So let's end on this. Do you have a prediction for how on-court coaching evolves in the next few years? Uh, I don't. Um that's kind of a boring answer for you because part of the thing I'm uh, tentative about is, you know, going into a match, there's often not that many secrets. I mean, true. a player knows what the opponent's strength is, what their weakness is, what their own strengths are, weaknesses are. And there's only, you know, ABC plans you could do. So, uh, I'm, yeah, I think, uh, I'd have to think about that one, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm not thinking it's going to have a massive, massive effect. I'm more bullish on analytics, being able to maybe help players improve in training so that when they come to the match, they actually have something new to, to reveal or, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm bullish on analy analytics, being able to guide players on whether their things they're working on in training are actually resulting in more RPMs or more speed or more accuracy using things like tennis insights, um, shot quality or something like that. But during the match, um, yeah, I'm not sure about, about that. I know like some players seem to be incredibly responsive, like Alcaraz with Ferrero telling him a lot of things, but you know, there's players like Manorino out there who just don't want to know anything and, and or Medvedev. just want to play on field. 
or Medvedev. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, maybe maybe players have to learn to become more adaptive during matches to leverage that data. Um, but maybe that'll be a long term thing. We'll see. I think that'll slowly happen too. I like your answer, right? I mean, you can't overload with information and that can certainly backfire. Um, but also the thing about the long, you know, the data informing what you need to work on or what you should be working on. I was actually talking to, uh, to Bradley Klon yesterday, um, who, who's a former top 100 player. And he was saying the match analytics for him were not very helpful. Like in terms of mm. if, if you're going to show me this is the this is the data from a match doesn't help me that much. But then as as I I guess what I kind of said was I could see that. But what about the season long stuff? What about if you were to look at either yourself or your opponents and you had that long term data over the, over large sample sizes and that told you about yourself as a player, about your opponents? In, in a much less concentrated and matchup specific way. And that's, those are the analytics that get me way more excited. Like I love to break down matches and all on, on Monday match analysis. And I want as much analytics and data as possible to be able to support my arguments and to help me. But the stuff that's really missing where I feel like there's a hole is, is in the long-term season long stuff that we're so obsessed with in other sports, right? How many, from the basics, like how many goals does Messi have this year to the more complex ones? Like, um, you know, what is the, it, it, I don't know, it, you know, the more complex analytics that we've begun to track season long in these other sports. That's where tennis has a gaping hole. Mm. Do you mean like looking at, uh, again, tennis insights, like year long performers on a forehand or a backhand or a serve? Or do you mean more like, oh, this player tends to serve here 60% of the time across the season or during the clay swing? Is that what you mean? Here's an example. It's the most basic stat in the world. It's an essential, essential stat. And we don't use it and we have no clue about it. Percent, let's just take a shot, forehands in. What is mm. a player's percent forehands in over the course of this season? The season. Mm. How much is that going to tell you about the consistency of, of, a, of a shot? And it's like this person, if I know that this person is in the top 100 ranking 85th in percent forehands in, it, it's going to change the way I look at playing them, right? Mm. How basic mm. is that? Just percent forehands in. We don't have that. Tennis yeah, Insights does, does have yet. That. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I agree. Like uh, just – with the data and with the technology, it's capable of just producing reams of it. Why not? Yeah. Get it all out there and, and let people get stuck into it. You know? Yeah. I, I agree. Like, I think it'd be cool to see so-and-so is making 10% more backhands and they're also changing direction 5% more compared to last season, things like that, because yeah, the, those small percentage changes are often, a they're, they're often the reason they're either doing better or doing worse. So, yeah. Hugh, this has been awesome. So much fun. Um, I, I enjoy reading you every week. And uh, this this was uh, great that we could get together and chat. I'm sure we'll do it again soon. Thanks for having me, Gil. Um, yeah, I listen to you every week as well. So the feeling's mutual. And um, yeah, be happy to join anytime. Thanks. Awesome.